to have you and welcome uh, to the museum's artist talk series. Uh, and, and again, congratulations, because you put together a really wonderful exhibition at the museum. It was well received and it was also a very thematically very meaningful. So um, that was terrific. Um, so as customary, I usually like to read a little bit about the artists that we are featuring. So I am going to just focus on that for the moment. Um, so just give people uh, some information about who you are. If I can see in this dark, oh, here we go. Uh, Gustavo Oviedo, now 39, was born in Paris, but raised in France, Colombia, Venezuela, and Mexico before finally relocating to Miami. In Miami, painting graffiti was a means to learn the city, connect with other teenagers, and was a common language that helped him adapt to a new foreign culture. With Miami's art scene booming and adulthood calling, Oviedo broke away from the clandestine world of that graffiti culture and decided to explore a part of Miami that didn't include abandoned buildings and that, that I'm sorry, that didn't include abandoned buildings and construction sites, the Biscayne Bay. Over the past 15 years, Oviedo has developed a highly personal self-taught style of art that explores the relationship between the bustle of Miami's vibrant metropolitan metropolitan streets and the tranquility of the Biscayne Bay's aquatic life, currents, and marine dystopia. That is a really fascinating uh, introduction to you. And so I, I want to get to the, the uh, beginning of your story because you're, you, you were born in Europe. Yes, my, my parents are from Argentina, but they left Argentina very young. And uh, they went to Brazil and where they basically, uh, you know, my father found a job with a French company that he did really good. So they sent them to France when my mother was already pregnant. And, uh, and that's, uh, they sent them to France to train. So that's how I ended up in France for a couple of years. Then, you know, once they trained them, they send them to Colombia, Venezuela, Mexico. And then, and then around, uh, I believe I was like around 11 or something, it, um, we went to France, but instead of Paris, we were in Grenoble, which is in the Alps, which is where that picture was taken. But that, you know, I left France probably like around 95, uh, 96, the two for Miami. And so this picture is probably for, from me coming back, you know, or around right before I left. It's kind of blurry, it's a long time ago. So what, what caught your attention to graffiti and, and this culture? What was, what was around you? What was informing you that yeah, made well, you want to take part? In, in Europe, you know, I, I, you have a very independent life very early on. So 11 or 12, I started going out and, and you know, skating and, and finding other kids to skate with. And that was kind of like my, my way to make friends besides uh, school. And, and these kids, you know, we would go around the city, exploring the whole city. And, you know, I will always notice graffiti, but I wasn't really into it, you know, because I was more into skating. But, you know, then at one point, other kids that skated did it. And I, I was curious about it. And, uh, and I, I got started, you know, right away. Um, my, my, the way I got started with art or thinking about it is through my mother. She was a, uh, she is an artist and, and she had art studios in all those countries that we lived in. And she had art exhibitions where she sold art, you know, like it, when I was really young, I would go to her exhibits. And, and so I was, and she, and you know, my parents in general always took me to museums all around the world. So I was always very conscious about art, but never found the way to express art onto a found graffiti around 12, 12 years old. And so you started writing past and, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, you're, uh, let me just stop for a second because you're, you're, the connection with you is a little bit pixelated. Um, okay. Let me see how, if I could. Uh, it looks good on mine. It looks good on your end? Yeah, on my yeah. end, it looks a bit pixelated. Um, all right, maybe that's a little better. But Pest, how, how did you decide on a name for yourself? Yeah, that was a tricky one. At first, I, I, I was just kind of... Uh, writing my real name because I didn't have no one teaching me for a long time, any of the rules or anything. So, so for a while I was writing Gustavo in, in friends. And then, um, and then I, I started writing just with a J. And then I, I, and at one point I became aware of a, a, a just in, in New York, you know, even, and so I changed the J for a P. Yeah. That, 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 that's one of my, not my first, but like, I would say like, 
you know, after two, three years of playing around with spray cans, I was probably like 14 or 15 years old. Um, and that, and that was in France in a, in a pennant in uh, Grenoble. And so who were you aware of in, in, in France at that, at that point? Cause there was so, you know, so many great painters. Oh, the, the master, I mean, I, I have, I have his book, you know, that, that is called uh, a Paris on car, which I probably bought back then when I was a kid. And, Mo too, you know, was a, a, a king, you know, like already back then. And uh, people like Locust caught my eye, a ski, uh, John Juan, like his freestyles were, you know, my, my first introduction to non letter based uh, graffiti mural art. And um, later on, I discovered Futura. But, but those were the, the ones, and, and locally, you know, because those were more in Paris, but locally, the uh, Air, Air Rioc, Ariok in Grenoble was a really good um, writer in Sentu and uh, Heist. I like Heist. He had a very American style in, in that, that you didn't find too much in, in France. And so in, in terms of you doing graffiti, well, since your mom comes from an art background, was she accepting of it? Well, she didn't find out. <laughs> she, 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 uh, at the time that I started, she was living in, in Miami already. And I was living with my father in, in Grenoble, and my father was traveling a lot for work. So, so uh, you know, my, my mother didn't really find out I, I did graffiti until six years later when I was 18, probably. Or 17, five years later. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, something happened that she found out. But, uh, you know, um, it, it, they, nowadays they're proud. They, they, now that they see where it's taking me, they, they completely love it. They, they're all about it. You know, not so much graffiti because I'm not so much into that, but they respect where it came, where all my art has come from, you know? Right. Now, let, let me ask you a question. In terms of, in France, were you hitting any of the metros and any of the rails? No, no, I was, I was really young, you know? So, so I would do, what I would do, I would go to abandoned buildings and I, and I, and I would, uh, you know, I, I would go and, and do pieces, but I wouldn't practice much. The whole thing in France was, wasn't as heavy on style and, 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 and you know, it, like at least at that age. So, I, you know, I would paint a lot in pennants in France and, you know, I would catch little tags here and there, but, but I didn't do anything big, you know, because I was a, a little kid, you know. And, and at what point, when, at this particular piece is interesting for me because it has to me a a a uh, a flavor of uh of miami or or yeah well this is already Epson. later on because i moved to miami in 95 96 so this is at the dam tracks in in uh in miami already like i already had like four four years to adapt to the to the local style you mentioned something really interesting to me that in in europe uh and, and in your travels you were just straight painting and that when you came to the U.S., you saw that the writers here had black books that they were drawing style um, and practicing. Yes. Over here, what what, what happens is is they in in Miami, I noticed that kids had less independence and and they had less access to to places to paint because because uh, everything is more distant, so you need a car and and you know as teenagers were 15, 16, it, it it seemed that like everyone was really heavy on graffiti but they didn't practice it outside. They were more, you know, they, there was this whole black book culture where like in high school, we would have these black books and we pass them around and, each, and it was a form of respect to paint on each other's or draw on each other's black book. And, and, and then, you know, in that process at the time, I didn't speak much English. So, so that, those were the only friends I really had uh, in high school because, you know, it, like I, I already related to them through graph. It, but I found out really fast that my style wasn't up to par to the local level, right? So like in France, the, 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 the style levels weren't as, in, in terms of letters, not art, but letters, it weren't at the level that they were already here in Miami. So, so I had to, some catching up to do because people were talking, you know, bad about my letter style, so I couldn't let them talk like that. So, right. so, I, so there was so, a very fast learning curve from when I moved over here in, in, in 95 to 99, those four years, in, in, in high school were, or, you know, three or four years were very heavy duty and in, in just um, developing letter styles and, 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 you know, getting to the point that nobody could talk about anything. 
Right, and it, it's a bit of pressure because there were a lot of good writers already like established here at that point. So when you get to Miami, uh, who did you hook up with and where did you paint? I know you painted well, at, at the Penance. Well, and like the first kids that, that I, I started painting with were, were the kids from my high school, which was DD Crew, Reverse, X, Big, um, you know, that, that was my crew. And, and, and you know, they, they had cars, so we, we, we you know, we would go on, on, on missions and we would do a lot, and, you know, and that's kind of like the people that I grew up with, you know, in my, in my first, in my second stage of, of graph, I guess, you know, and, and, and uh, DD Crew was very prolific, you know, and, and then at one point, you know, um, once I graduated and, and, and we, you know, I was already 20 years old, I started painting with other people besides my crew. And uh, through and the people that, that have had a big influence at the time, like when I was 19 and 20, that they were like, you know, 10 years older than me was uh, um, Freak, Dan Crew, and, uh, and Max, and Crew. Those were two people that took me on. And, and uh, even though I was a lot younger than them and, and, and would, you know, uh, we would paint together and, they, and I learned a lot from, from seeing how they were doing things. And those two people to me were kings and are kings of, of the Miami history, you know, Miami graffiti history. Right, and, and you guys would paint in Penance and of course the famous Miami Stadium. Tell me about why this place is so special, the, the Bobby Miami. Well, this, this, these places were like, you know, the Penance in Miami, like whether it's the Miami Stadium, the Hialeah Penance, or, or, you know, the Marine Stadium, they're, they're like museums, you know, they're like churches slash museums of graffiti where people um, go over there. Back, back when I was painting a lot in the beginning, there wasn't much of an internet graffiti scene. So if you wanted to see things, you had to go to these places. So, and you will bring a disposal camera and record everything because you didn't have computers or things like that to, to, to look into the stuff. And, uh, and so it was a whole experience because it wasn't always safe. You know, sometimes there was people doing things that, you know, like doing crazy stuff in there and, and there were abandoned places where there was no security or anything like that. But that was part of the fun. It was part of the adventure and kind of like, you know, you had to pay your dues and, and show up and, 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 and take a little bit of a risk in order to know what was happening in terms of people painting and or, yeah, or it, you, able you, to you also yourself. gained some, some survival skills as well yeah you know i mean it's just just learning just learning about about every situation you know like like that's at the at the marine stadium and that was 2001 and so here something seems to start happening in your work you start breaking away from convention in terms of uh you know the format of of letter writing you you're you're just really kind of got this strong silhouette of letters uh but with it's very graphic very like super graphic design well what you know really invested yourself in this at this point what are you thinking about graffiti is it just getting up or is it being artistic it's it's a mix of both i, I, I you know the, the 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 getting fame part of it was always fun you know it's always like even there, I, I wrote "Are you him?" and and that that came from from an, an incident at a party where it was a house party, and I and I didn't know many people there, but I was with my my friends, and 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 some kid came up to me and and was like, you know, um, are are you him? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, are are you are you passed? And I'm like, and I was really young at the time, so I, it, to me it was one of the first times that I had that kind of interaction, and 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 it kind of stuck with me, so. It, yeah, it's definitely fun, that part of it. But the other part that's very fun is, is just being creative and, and pushing yourself to evolve and, and find uh, new ways to, to express these letters and, 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 and kind of like evolving your own DNA and, and just seeing how far it could go. That's the Hialeah pennant when it was getting destroyed. And so that, that's a pennant that where I, I learned a lot from. And, and I would skip class, uh, you know, catch the Metro Rail to... to uh, to the station over there and, 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 and have fun over there. And, and, you know, it was pretty far, and, but it was a blast because there's so many walls. It was like an endless amount of walls and people painting. That's the Bobby Maduro Stadium when it was getting destroyed. Um, so, so, you know, it was kind of like always surprising to show up to somewhere where that you, you were expected to see everything that you've seen and then, they, you know, realizing that it's going to be gone. And, and it kind of made... Uh, documentation that much more important, like taking pictures of everything because you you know you you don't know when when it's gonna be gone. So how else did this affect you? Kind of like the the, the breaking down and and the 
the um, that you know because it's a landmark for graffiti writers, but now all of a sudden it's being destroyed. It's not there. So the question yeah, is, you, where, you feel a little you... nostalgic. It's like someone coming and, and you know, if you have a gallery or a museum and all of a sudden they destroy a museum. But at the end of the day, you don't own the property, and you know you realize that it was just temporary. You, and and you know and with graph that's one of the beautiful things that that you do you have is this detachment to it. It's once you finish it, it's gonna have its own life. It's it's not it's not safe in someone's home like an art piece or in a museum. It's it's out in public or out in exposed to the elements. And so you kind of accept like even though the, you're putting so much effort into it, you accept that it might be gone for whatever reason. So so that's part of graph in general. So I was always okay with that. Yeah, that's uh, uh, the word everyone likes to use is ephemeral. Uh, that yeah. get tossed, that's get tossed around quite a bit. Yeah, that so was the here... sound. So, so that's the thing is that, you know, there was different periods of time where I would paint in, in different places, whether it's Bobby Maduro or Haile Apane and or, or the Marine Stadium. And some of them overlap and some when they will end, they, there will be other openings. And, and one opening that there was in 99 to 2001 was this area in Overtown where like now you have like clubs like Space or Eleven. Like that whole area was industrial and there's really not much going on besides like a lot of drug addicts and crazy stuff going on. So, and, you know, at the same time, all the people that were going to make those places into uh, clubs were fixing them up. And I met with a few of them when I was around 20 and 19. And, and I started asking them, hey, can I paint this wall? So we started doing... Me and my crew and me and different uh, friends, we started just taking over Overtown. And then that just kind of like other people like started painting too. So it became kind of like a Wynwood uh, Arts District before that, before the, it was, there was such a thing or, or before there was an appreciation by the city uh, about, you know, how muralism and, and, and whether it's graph or street art or, or just murals, how it could bring up an area and, and, and help it, you know, increase the value. So what happened around 2001, 2002, the, the city started just buffing everything without even asking uh, the property owners because there, there was this thought back then that graffiti would devalue the area instead of bring up value. Ironically, a few years later, the opposite happened in Wynwood and then realized that, that it's better not to touch the walls. Yeah, that, that was interesting. I, I, I came down here in 2002 uh, for Art Basel exhibit with a bunch of heads from New York. Um, and we noticed something. It was, a, a, it was like a revitalization, sort of the, the energy of the art scene, quote unquote, started to, you know, kind of we caught the attention or, you know, I mean, Miami's always had that, you know, graffiti culture going on regardless. But the muralism and all that caught the eye and that we kind of sensed the change in the air. Um, yes, it, I mean, it, it was it was going on in Overtown for a while. And then I, I think that in terms of, of, of the Wynwood area, it really started picking up after the second or third year of, of our Basel, which was 2003 to 2005, it's even 2006, seven. Like there, there was different um, organizations, art organizations that would start inviting people from other countries and other cities to come and paint. And, and that just kind of like added to what was going on already here from the local artists. And it just became like this thing where every year during Art Basel, when the people were having their art shows and galleries and convention centers, there was all these uh, um, hundreds of people coming from all over the world to paint and make that neighborhood into what it is now, which is- How, how, did, the local, how did the local crews um, take that? Um, then I, th I think, I mean, you, you have all kinds of reactions, but in, ge in general, I think it was super positive because the, the local crews were actually organized themselves and, and paint I-95 and, 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 you know, collaborate with each other. So all the crews would paint I-95. You would have like five crews with different members representing people painting the what's RC Cola now. And that was a tradition that kept on getting done every year during our Basel. So in general, I think that, that it was is good. Obviously, you know, um, you, you always have a, a competition spirit in between anybody. So, yeah. so, so there's always that, but, but in general, I, I think that everybody understands that, that it really helped out the, the local scene, whether it's in the gallery world, museum world, or the mural world. Right, so that I would imagine that starts informing how you paint and how you think about art 
And um, one of the things I notice in your paintings, particularly from this one, um, especially from the last slide to this slide, um, something starts to happen in your thinking about style writing and shapes and abstraction. Uh, yes, I, I started just looking at, at, at the, the letters, it, taking away the fills and, and taking away the, the you know, the, the, the classic outline of graffiti and, and, and just kind of trying to make shades. It's, it's a style, honestly, that, that I saw done by a lot of New York people. You know, at the time, you know, one of the people that I was actually very, like, into a, a crew that I was really into was FX crew. So I saw them not using outlines, and, and I, I kind of tried it on my own for this one particular piece. And, um, you know, it, it's not something that I stuck with for a long time. But, you know, like, what I did stick with is, is, is something that I had worked on for a long time, which is the, the letter, the letter, using the letters as a, as a graphic element more than just letters. So yeah, I'm so, glad you when, say that. Letters, go ahead. Yeah, I'm glad you say that because that leads me because you, you know, you write past 131, right? And yeah. then you, you, you really start paring that down so much that you move away from the name into the graphic design, right? The kind of uh, hidden message in the, in the, in the, the yeah, uh, so, mathematical so, equation. So, so yeah, I had to like, separate because you know as you know and everybody knows and in, 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 that's into graffiti graffiti has uh, on kind of like these rules and regulations if you want to be like a respectful of the art form and and i always wanted to be respectful of the art form so so i separated you know past from this number uh so so that i could express many things with this number and and i and achieve communicating with people that weren't necessarily into the graffiti scene you know, when you have an equation that doesn't make sense, you know, like it, it's not going to only catch the attention of, of the graffiti writer, but it's going to catch the attention of anybody that knows math. And that's everybody. So so that was my interest behind that it was is I wanted to play with with, with the communication through through this wheat paste and stickers and just using math, which is, you know, the, the language of nature and everything. So your thinking is shifting towards art, right? You're, 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 at this point, when you're young, you, have, you, you presented this slide to me from 2002. This was your first exhibition. Um, yeah, what well, it wasn't my first, first exhibition, but it was my first serious uh, two-man exhibition, you know? Right. And my first exhibition was in 99 when I sold a piece uh, in, in, in 99 at the Green Door Gallery. Um, this was already, I already had a few experiences, but this was the first time that I had time in advance and they gave us the whole gallery to herself. It wasn't a big group show. It was like just two people. And it was me and Max and crew. And we, we decided to paint these murals on plywood, uh, you know, that would have our pieces and these uh, um, Baudet characters that were the Miami mice. So, so we had that in a gallery called Objects Art, actually a couple of blocks from when the museum is back in 2002 when there was very, very few, um, like, galleries you know there was only like locus projects and and right. gallery and dorsch there was probably like two or three galleries and objects art was was uh, a artist owned gallery that that was cool with graph and and they let us make it happen what, what's interesting is that now you start to parlay this idea of showing in a gallery into really kind of making art that has the gestures of graffiti but isn't like like in your tradition of graffiti um w w tell me a bit about these early works yes it, it's i had to use yeah so so it, it's always i, I try not to uh, venture into things that i'm not good at or that i'm not naturally inclined to do like drawing reality and things like that so what i was good at what i felt my strength was was letter style and later form and expressing letters so i was so comfortable with it that i was able to break you know use it as a as a pattern and, and kind of communicate different ideas that they didn't have to do with letters, even though letters could be found in there. It was more just about interconnectivity and, and just how, you know, how I could get a, a pattern going that, that was more than is a graph piece. And it wasn't about my tag anymore. It was more about this, this technical challenge of, of doing these interconnections between letters and upside down letters and sideways letters and, and not even letters. So, so, so that's what I started doing with these paintings in, in the early 2000s. And actually, that, the one in the right is from 19, uh, 1999. Uh, so that, I started very early on with that. Once I started you know, 
getting better at, at doing pieces. One of the things that's interesting to me as we set head, we're going to go slide into kind of your more contemporary work is that the organic nature of, 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 of these lines, right? Um, uh, while you, you may have seen them as t kind of technical drawings, they're, they're really a prelude to what, what happens next, right? What, you, what catches your eye? Um, and that is the aquatic world, right? That is, yes. that is, that is you know, this, this life under the, under the ocean. Um, uh, this is an installation of, of, I think that exemplifies some of that. You wanna tell me something about this, this installation? Yeah, this was a commission for a restaurant in Lincoln Road called Chotomate. And um, they actually had tried to do a mural twice before, before they, you know, with other artists and before they invited me to participate and it, it didn't work out. So when I came in, I only had a, a, a certain amount of time. I only had like a week and a half or something like that. And there's a really large uh, canvas. It's our orchestral canvas uh, prying onto the wall or, or, you know, attached to the wall. And, and, um, and at the time I had a regular job, so I had to go from nine to six to my job. And then I would show up to the wall at eight and paint until like two, three in the morning and then go to sleep and go back to work and so on. So it was a lot of pressure because, you know, the, the owners of the restaurant, you know, were, were, were not patient. They liked my work. They saw my work from before. So, you know, this particular piece was a, a complete freestyle. As part of the freestyle, you know, you, you, you can't tell them, you can't show them what it's going to happen because you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, so, so they were like, you know, a, a, as they progressed, they got, they got, they felt safer and they, you know, but at first, you know, the first week, it, it took a long time to add on to it in order for them to, to be okay with where it was going. But, you know, I, I, a lot of it has to do with things that you can't see. You know, I, I take a, 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 a lot of, um, explore. I take a lot of trips, you know, on my boat to go see uh, reefs and underwater locations and things like that. And and I bring those experiences back with me. And I try to blend some of those feelings uh, of what I remember, not specific things, but just just more like you know feelings of what I saw and mix that with what I know how to do good, which is you know uh, graphic abstract work. And, and try right. to we, find a, a, a meeting of both that's not literal, but it, it, the idea is there. Right. I, you know, and I see this in this, what's interesting about this slide um, with the continuous line um, that could be um, interpreted se se several ways, right? As, as perhaps writing or, or perhaps as um, symbol, symbolic of waves or, or seismic activity even. Um, but it's the act of writing and long form writing. Um, uh, and what's interesting is that you, you, this is a motif you keep coming back to, which is very interesting to me. So is that connected to water? Not or, necessarily. Is... It, it, it's a happy accident that, that people make that reference. But where it comes from, it, it comes from my, my, my love for computers in my early 20s. I was really into computers. I did a lot of uh, studying with uh, motion graphics, 3D animation, and I was fascinated by how binary codes create such complicated uh, uh, results by just ones and zeros. So having, you know, numbers like one and three, you know, I, I wanted to create my own by one-liners that, that were connected and that wouldn't stop, you know, like basically, the one liner when you don't take off the the pen off the wall and i and i just uh, it started you know it, it's kind of like a hypnotic and and it actually you know in in later time nowadays i find it like a, a really easy way to sign pieces without having to sign in the corner to me it always bothers me when, when i've had to sign that doesn't bother me but you know sometimes this could be it could work but you know signing pieces in the corner takes away from the composition a lot of times of the piece. Right. So, so I like, you know, with this binary code, I'm able to sign pieces like that one without having to have a signature per se in the corner. It's already signed and it's a, a thing of itself too. And, and, and you know, waves, patterns, uh, you know, math, science, it's yeah. everywhere. So, so uh, it's a little, it's a, it, you can interpret it so many ways, huh? right? You can interpret it even as white noise, you know, and, and it's yeah. very interesting. Um, yeah. 
I, and again, it's something that runs through your work. One of the things you've done recently is this, this is a contemporary piece, right? Yes, and, that, that's, it's called um, uh, Warming Stripes. It was for the Rockefeller Foundation and the Adrian Arch Foundation in the city of Miami. And it's basically a, a container turned into an education center for climate change and resiliency. So it, the, the stripes in the background is, is signify the color change from dark blue to lighter blue to red, red colors signifies the, the temperature changes and how they throughout the century got hotter and hotter and, and, and we're at a point where like things turn red. So if you Google the warming stripes, that, that's actually like a scientific visual representation of, of, of how climate has changed and, and how Earth keeps on getting warmer throughout the century. And then in terms of the shapes on top of it, my, my concept behind that was, you know, um, I, I, I happened to, to work on a mural at the Russell Steel School of Marine Atmospheric Science where I, I met with this, uh, you know, professor that, that commissioned a piece, a mural piece over there for me from the University of Miami. And, and her name was Lisa, Lisa Beal. And through her, I, I learned a lot about currents of water and warm currents of water and, and cold currents of water and how those uh, ocean currents are what keeps uh, the balance of, of, of the rest of the climate in, in, in Earth. And, 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 you know, and that's why she's studying those currents, because once you're able to understand those currents, you're able to understand the changes and, and, and what's going on. And in terms of my shapes, I, you know, just by applying certain colors, you know, I kind of like symbolically attach that meaning to them for that piece. And this is a collage at the Art Center of South Florida for an exhibition that happened in 2014. It's called Nothing Goes to, Wa uh, Nothing Goes to Waste was the name of the exhibition. And uh, that one's Future Sculpture Fund. And, uh, and it's basically using vinyl collage as, as a, a, a means to transfer colors and shapes into the wall. It's a, a temporary uh, piece, you know? So to me, it kind of reminded me of, of how you had to detach uh, from the work, like, like when you did a, a piece on a pennant you know, that you didn't know if it was gonna gone over or if it was, the, the building was gonna be gone. These pieces, you kind of know that at, at one a point, they're gonna have to rip them out, out of the wall. And, you, and it, but it doesn't take it away, it doesn't take away from the effort that you put into them. Uh, as no, you're... but you, 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 you translate it again, you, you package it in a frame, right? And, and, and that is part of the, part of the experience, uh, you know, that it, it's not all lost, it's, it's kind of contained and part of it's saved. Yes, the things that I learned from doing the collagen on the walls uh, definitely like were translating into these collage pieces that I framed up and, and then I've exhibited in, in many galleries throughout time and, 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 and in, in some ways have uh, helped me discover new ways to use my skills, you know, like whether it's space, or uh, a sense of spacing and negative space and wh whether it's color combos or shape combos or, or I call these uh, narrative abstractions, meaning that I'm telling stories by uh, using abstract shapes that are not relatable in the real world. A lot of my work has to do with the things that you can't see, um, like whether it's feelings or, or the infinite small, or the infinite big or, or nature or gravity or, or just microorganisms in a reef in the water Things that you're not able to see, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in applying uh, abstract um, art in order to tell the stories. It's hands I, I, I want to talk more about this, this connection between you and, and um, you know, your real life experience as an artist, but also a person who becomes uh, environmentally conscious. Um, how, how did that happen for you? Well, and when I started, you know, at one point, you know, I, I had to like, kind of like take a pause or, you know, a, 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 a early retirement from, from, the, from the graph scene. And, and one of the things that, that happened is I got a little boat, you know, and, uh, and this little boat, I started taking it out a lot. And I started using the things that I learned in graph and with the boat, I started documenting, I started exploring, I started wanting to learn about history. All things that I had learned from graph that I was doing for graph, I started doing it for the ocean. And then the ocean was a brand new playground where there was so much to learn and so much to, to have fun with. So, so I started uh, going out there and, uh, hold on, I, I forgot your question. <laughs> no, this, this connection between you and, and the environment. Oh, well, the environment, the environment part is, is more like just a, a result of, of me being out there and seeing things that, that I didn't know about. You know, I didn't know that abandoned islands in the park 
there was buoys attached to the mangroves and 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 i didn't know the styrofoam was a uh, that bad that that you know fish would eat it and stuff like that so i started just picking up the styrofoams as, as a reason to, to the buoys as a reason to go out there it's kind of like giving myself missions the same way that with graph you you invent these missions that you gotta do i gotta go do this wall i gotta go do this thing yeah you, you know and then you gotta go document it like the same way it was like okay now i gotta go get those buoys so it wasn't necessarily at first that i was trying to clean up stuff or right? i was just trying to make art and and the, some of the only things that you could bring back with you from the ocean are are trash human degree yeah. trash so so I started looking for patterns, and one pattern was the buoys and the mangoes. Another pattern was a, a old glass bottles underwater. Another pattern was microplastics. Another one was ropes, or another one was balloons that that happy birthday balloons that end up in the ocean and they float and, around for months, and then you found them. So, it, it you know it was you know it's not until I start showing these pieces in exhibitions that people start having environmental comments and reactions to them that I started learning about some of the effects that like a really good example at this show called Nothing Goes to Waste, you know, in at the Arts Center in South Florida in 2014, this lady saw this piece of, of me taking pictures of the balloons that were floating in Biscayne Bay. And, and she told me, oh, that's so nice that you're doing this for the turtles. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, uh, what am I doing for the turtles? And she's like, oh, you didn't know, like the turtles eat these balloons and they get asphyxiated and, they, and, then, that, and then they die. I mean, I mean, I didn't know about this. You know, I just thought that a balloon on floating water was a really good picture, you know? So that's why I did it. And so it's kind of like a, a, a happy accident. And for a long time, uh, I've, I've said that I'm an accidental environmentalist, not necessarily a full out environmentalist. Right. But, it, but, but you know, the, it, I, as time passes and the more I get involved with the water and the more, the more I, I see the dystopia of, of how like the corals are dying and, and they're bleached and, and how, how much trash there's out there. Of course that, you know, I, I, I would like to attach some of the messages to my art when I'm reaching out to an audience and reaching out to so many eyes, I would like to be more than just about my art and more about like other things that are bigger than my art. Right, because you're witnessing, you're going under and actually witnessing all the change that's, that's happening underground. Um, and I, and I, I happen to like how you repurpose it um, at, for the, you know, symbiosis was a really expansive idea about this. Uh, the exhibition itself with, with some of the uh, found objects and, and the paintings, of course. Um, and, you know, one of the centerpieces that you brought up was the, the, the rope. Um, yes. And, and yes. We, we went, tell we me went a bit about the, the power of this. We picked it up from the ocean. The, 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 I mean, I don't know if power, but the message behind it is, is, is that it's, it's, it is like, what are we doing that this, there's conglomerates of, of, of ropes that are not being used for anything that just end up there for that to pick it up or, or, or to why doesn't it disintegrate? Why can't we use materials that are, are disintegratable like hemp ropes? You know, these are plastic ropes that, uh, you know, they just stay there and, and sometimes they get covered by sand. So they're just going to be part of that environment for a long time. So that's well, kind of like the message behind that is that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, like, let's rethink about the materials that we use for certain marine activities like buoys. Why does it have to be styrofoam, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I, for, for me, this was an interesting piece in that it kind of struck me as the, enti the entanglement of, of, of humanity and nature. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and it's true. And, 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 and that's where it touches into the symbiosis, where symbiosis for this exhibition that I did at the Museum of Graffiti had different uh, levels of meaning. So one, you know, the, the main one would be the collaboration uh, between you know, me and the museum per se. And then another one would be the collaboration between my, my graffiti background and my current abstract uh, underwater world inspired work. So those two colliding again. And then a third meaning is, is talking, and this probably is one of the more important meanings of symbiosis is, is the collaboration between human debris and, and the ocean. Because for example, there, there's, there, you know, there's a lot of trash out there and, and you tend to think all trash is bad, but what, what you have to realize is that some trash becomes fish in marine life's home, right? So, you know, when we're taking out th those ropes, 
you know, they, there was eels inside of it, you know, so we had to throw back the eels. And, 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 and then we realized, you know, we just evicted a pair of eels from this rope uh, conglomerate. So how much good did we really do, even though we're trying to help, you know? And, and, yeah. there's, and there's a lot of trash like that. There's a lot of fiberglass trash that the nurse sharks use as a, as a protection, like, you know, because it, it, it emulates the same things that coral rocks and coral boulders do, you know, the human trash is doing it. And sometimes when it's metal, because uh, not all uh, materials, human materials could uh, support coral formations, but some materials like metal and steel have coral grow into it. So that's things that you can't even really take, you know, because well, like you, you mentioned to me, it has life on it, so you gotta leave it there, you know. So it's what, tra what? This trash out there. It's actually being put there on purpose. They're called artificial reefs. So it's like when they they grab these iron uh, ships and they just sink them on purpose for it to become a habitat uh, and have a whole community of, of symbioses between human trash and uh, and nature. Yeah, and it's it's a powerful message to be a connection to be making and 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 all of these and uh, one of the things I had mentioned to you one of the things that attracted me to this work was my my I used to dive myself and I worked at a at a magazine um, skin diver that was one of the top diving magazines and you would start all these sh shapes the coral the the organic nature of things and the color the vibrancy of life on beneath us that we have no clue of how important it is to our well-being but also uh, the kind of inspiration it has creatively um, as well and one of the things that i like that you shared with me was that in some of these works you were actually using uh, the sponges uh, to make imprints on your work yes yeah. Well, I always try to like, like use like the 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 idea of, of of referencing things without directly, and you know, hello. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I froze on my image, so I didn't know. So, so I, I. Yeah, is it? Are you cutting out? Fine, right? And and they they. They're kind of making reference to how you, you're not able to touch anything in the ocean. And like everything it has, if you touch any, if it sends certain particular corals, you get skin reactions. And, and, and there's all these like, uh, er, you know, like the ocean's an aggressive place. It's, it's an like alien place for human beings. So, so that, that's where, for example, that, that particular yellow piece it's kind of making reference to that, how, you know, whether it's a scorpion fish or whether it's a lion fish that's venomous or, or, or the teeth of sharks or, or, or eels. There, there's a lot of sharp, dangerous stuff out there that you got to respect when you're over there, you know? So, so that, those are references that I make with, in terms of these abstract narrations. And, uh, and, and you know, it, for the show itself, I, I was lucky enough to know about the show uh, before... Uh, before the the virus hit, and I was able to use that quarantine time and the lockdown time to to concentrate on on producing all new work that 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 has my DNA from graffiti, but also uh, embedded some of the things that I've learned through collaging, the aesthetics of my collages. It, that's that was the goal in terms of technique is that uh, how to. Um, translate this collage vector looking clean line bold solid color work into a canvas with paint in the most efficient and and, and presentable way so so you know i kind of discovered that technique before this exhibit and i experimented with but this is the first exhibit that i had enough time and 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 resources and and and, and the support of the museum and you guys to, to really concentrate on, on creating a body of work for the past five month, months and not really knowing if we were gonna be able to show it or not. So it was a blind bet, like I like to say, but, but the bet definitely worked out, you know, for the best. It, it worked and out very, and, very you know, I, I mean, it, it, again, I gotta give, give it to you because some of these things are so brilliant. Like even this one, it almost looks like brain coral. Um, yeah. And again, thematically, you know, you've managed to be very consistent with your the graphic nature of your work um the color palettes and how dynamic they are so what i want to do um with you that we've never done before with our audience is uh take a walk through 
um, in your ex exhibition. Um, but I, I, before I do that, I just want to point out, as you you may not see this until I pull pull into it, but again, that's you incorporating uh, a yeah. one three one into your work. Yes, and, and there's two renditions of it. There's the binary uh, signature style or binary one three one code, and then there's more of a stencil. Uh, one three one code. They're both referencing the same thing, and it, it was a way me juxtapose in a subtle way, you know. Right, right. So what I want to do now um, and share with everybody um, is the um, kind of a. This, this is unique for us to to be able to do this with you um, uh, right now and and to present. Um, uh, the the exhibition um, for you in in VR I mean a VR in 360 view uh, so that way you get an idea of of what Thank this installation and what this installation actually looked like right yes yeah, so and, this, and this this was a, a awesome collaboration with Pete Bahan and the Museum of Graffiti and myself and and we were able to uh, you know uh, record the 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 3D environment of the exhibition in order to preserve it for uh, for as long as there's the internet <laughs> or someone paying the the hosting, but uh, you know it, it's 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 fun it's fun because you know now that it's gone you know they're already installing the next show it, it's it's fun that we were able to see it and share it with others and 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 especially in these times with the all the all the virus uh, stuff you know like it. It's, it's it's an awesome way to, to share with people that are not able to attend during that the time of the exhibition. So right. Very, uh, well, what's, I feel very what's, fortunate what I, that we're able to do this. Uh, you know, thanks to the museum and everybody involved. Well, I, I mean, you hit a home run, I mean, and I like that. It's again, it's in context to Hello? a history you grew up. It's in context to a history you grew up with, right? In that room. That's history, and this is the result of, you know, um, the, your years of developing, right? And you, you presented yes. these really large-scale paintings as well. Um, yeah, no, I mean, to me, to, to, to have the honor to, to be invited by the museum, by Kat, uh, Allison, and yourself to, to have an exhibition, especially in, in the beginning of you guys' uh, museum, it's only been l less than a year or one year anniversary this week. Like to be yeah. part of that was such a, you know, the second that I, you guys asked me, I got like, like goosebumps because I knew what it meant for me, you know, a, a historically speaking, and just as an opportunity to share my work with, with a, a, a global audience. And, and so, so I, you know, I really used uh, this, this pandemic uh, quarantine sh lockdown as kind of like a, like a, a motivator you know, to, to make sure that, that I would do something where there was no room for doubting that, that, that I, I, I was worthy of having this kind of show in this kind of place, you know? Like, to me, it's such an important thing to be part of this history because it's part of my history, and my even if I'm not active uh, anymore, you know, to me, it's, it's I, I owe graffiti everything that I'm achieving nowadays uh, with my art, you know? And, and it, it's something you always envision to get recognition at some point and, 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 and it's not guaranteed, you know, and it, and it takes a long time and you got to stay patient and you got to stay busy and you got to do things, even if they don't work out, you got to keep on going. And, and, and I think that this exhibition is kind of like a, a, a really good sign for me that, that all that effort that I put in th throughout more than 25 years of, of painting on walls and doing art shows, it, you know, it worked out, you know, it was a, it was a good yeah, path. I, I mean, but it, Right. It, it, it also illustrates a, a really cohesive narrative, right, yeah. uh, which is important, right? There's something that runs right through this whole exhibition, yeah. right, that keeps yeah, you no, in that experience. Yeah, there, there, there's no cheating experience. There's no cheating time. And I think that I wasn't ready many years ago and to, to have a show of this caliber, like in terms of, of consistency and in terms of concept. I think that, that the opportunity showed up at the, at the right time where where I had done it enough times and I had learned from the past and 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 uh and just the intensity of of being stuck at home and not knowing if I was going to be able to continue an art career and and just trying to really do the best that I could 
and 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 really explore uh the things that I'm good at and 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 hold back and only do uh things that I'm good at in 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 a very strategic way and plan things ahead I have all these sketches from all the paintings a lot of them that I pre-planned and pre-thought you know the these things and 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 a lot of times I got to hold back cuz I I could go more complicated but then then it's not as easy to absorb for others you know so so I I I kind of like uh, develop this this simplistic like it's like a complex complex simplicity where I'm trying to um you know do the most with the most simple uh materials and techniques and shapes but do the most that I can with them do them as good as I can and and do the right choices even if there's not that many choices so so where do you go from here what's next for you well to me you know it's is 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 you know, i don't know you know it's it's things i think that this exhibition has planted many seeds you know in terms of my art creation i'll never stop doing art in terms of me being a full time artist who knows you know i'm definitely trying the my hardest but it, it you know I, the i'm lucky enough that i have video and other things as a right. backup but but you're also you if if i can interject you you're, you're going to present this again right part of oh, this yeah. exhibition yeah. we're going to show the exhibit in, in two different locations during Miami Art Week we're going to show the first half at the Shelbourne Hotel uh it's going to be there throughout the month but we're going to have a opening from 6 to 8 on December 2nd on Wednesday and then besides that at the museum's offices there's a a, a cluster of pieces there that we will be presenting as well. So the show keeps on uh, reviving it and thanks to uh Alison and Allen uh, they keep on finding ways to to share the work that uh, with others um uh, you know before before uh it's hitting. <laughs> Now it's I I got to tell you man it 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 was really fascinating when it was first proposed. Um I you, you know you speak to two things that are are lifelong interest to me both you know graffiti and diving and um and art wow there you go that's a lot and so when when i got to understand this a bit more i got to tell you i was really impressed and and really i think as a young artist well so to speak <laughs> uh, but that you have a command of your your not just your art but of your passion and your narrative um, thank you and, uh, I, I I appreciate that. I mean, you know, coming from people like you like that that are like a staple in 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 the art world and 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 have seen so much and 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 so many different people for you to say that is 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 a big deal for me and and you know and and I think that staying true to who I am and being honest about what I am as an artist is 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 the key. And 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 I think that's the key for every artist and every artist should yeah, strive to be it just not, and not try to be something else because they see it somewhere else and 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 just stick with it you know and stick with it develop it and and then you know nobody could deny it's yours you know and and I, I like you know you can't really be the most talented or the most creative or you could be the you know unique and and that's what i i i i strive to do i try to be my create unique artwork that is truly mine and and you could trace the dna down to the when i was 12 years old painting in france you know yeah. like like the images that i share with you you know like while i was collecting them i was i was realizing you know it, it's all connected it's it's you know and i'm i'm very proud of that you should be my man so on behalf of our crew here at the museum of graffiti i want to thank you for sharing the exhibition with us sharing your time with with explaining the show and your journey as a young artist and a, and a mature artist and uh really i i look forward to the next iteration of this coming up you know i can i look forward to stepping out and and checking it out and thank you, um yeah thank you and so, you to you for this interview and for all your help and thanks to alison and alan and and the whole uh, museum team you know this whole experience has been the 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 most amazing experience that i ever had in terms of showing work and sharing with others and thank you to everybody that came and everybody that's giving me feedback you know through the internet or in person i i appreciate everybody um, yeah. it's really really feels good and uh, i i love you all good so yeah and i just want to on the last note because we 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 are um 
lo looking at this in a, in a, as a walkthrough. So people can go to the museum website and experience this um, themselves, right? If they go to Museum of Graffiti exhibitions, they'll be yeah. able to walk through and learn more uh, about your exhibition. So, um, yeah, that, that is correct. That, 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 there's that, and, 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 the, and we'll documentation of is, is the book, and, and you know, now we'll, we'll show them again during the Shelbourne on that's Wednesday, right. and, there's and a at book. the museum, there's a couple of pieces out there, too, so they, they, they're Yeah, and the, they're and the, the book's available there's at the museum, so and they're, they're you can also purchase the book at the shop. <laughs> huh? Good. Cool, uh, man. So, well, have a good one, man. Appreciate you. Likewise, Gustavo, and uh, I'll see you next week. Cool. <laughs> Take care. Have a safe Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care.